<laughs> Sorry. I will start over again. Okay, welcome to the Yuri's Night New Horizons Hangout today on April 12th, Yuri's Night 2015. I'm Rick Hanton, the media director for the Yuri's Night Global Team, and joining me today is a huge group of people from NASA's New Horizons mission that is currently on approach to Pluto. I'm now going to go around the room and let them introduce themselves to you. Oh, hello. My, my name is Glenn Fountain. I'm the project manager for New Horizons uh, at the Applied Physics Laboratory. Hi, I'm Alice Bowman. I'm the Mission Operations, uh, Mission Operations Manager, or better known as MOM, for the New Horizons uh, program. Thanks. I'm Alan Stern. I'm a planetary scientist and the principal investigator for the mission. I'm from the Southwest Research Institute. Hi, I'm Jim Green. I'm the Director of Planetary Science at NASA Headquarters. Hi, I'm Kelsey. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher on the mission. Uh, my main area of expertise is geology and geophysics, but I also help with um, other things related to the spacecraft. I'm Alex Parker. I'm also a postdoctoral researcher with the mission here at Southwest Research Institute. Uh, my specialty is planetary astronomy and the Kuiper Belt, usually the small object populations. So uh, I think about the context of Pluto generally. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us today on a Sunday. So it's great that you were all able to come out on a weekend and help us out and talk all about New Horizons to us. And so I wanted to get started off and uh, you could you can have the person who is most knowledgeable or who wants to answer this question answer, but for the people out there who don't know, can you explain a little bit about what New Horizons is and, and why we launched this mission all the way out to Pluto? Sure. You want to take it, Jim? You want me to? No, oh, have at it, Alan. Okay, sure. So uh, New Horizons is a, an unmanned robotic spacecraft that was launched in 2006 um, to cross the entirety of the solar system to make the first exploration of the Pluto system and the first exploration of the Kuiper Belt. Uh, we'll be arriving in July, in fact about exactly three months from now on July the 14th and uh, this mission actually got its start many years ago back in the late 80s and early 90s. The scientific community uh, following the success of Voyager uh, wanted to see the Pluto system explored and as the case was built for that eventually it rose to the top priority of the uh, National Academy of Sciences Decadal Survey, uh, in part because of Pluto's context in the Kuiper Belt, and in part because of the many interesting aspects of uh, Pluto and its satellite system. So uh, uh, our team, which was formed from the Southwest Research Institute and the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, the two leadership organizations, uh, proposed to NASA in 2001 in a competitive process uh, in which there were multiple proposals that duped it out. Yeah, ours was fortunate to come out on top, and we spent uh, the years from 2002 to 2005 getting it built, and then launched it, as I said, in 2006. It became the fastest spacecraft ever launched, and has been racing across the solar system to its intercept with Pluto in July ever since. And as you said, Rick, now we're on final approach. Great. So... My next question would be, why exactly are we going to Pluto? Why not, you know, somewhere else? Well, I'll start that off, but I'd like to get um, Alex or even Jim oh, yeah. involved. And uh, uh, we're, we're going to Pluto because we're explorers, and the planetary science community, um, you know, makes priority decisions within that decadal survey process that I told you about, about um, where we get the most bang per buck. As I said, this rose to the top of the 2000s decadal survey. And the reason for that is in part because we've got a whole series of interesting questions about this new kind of planet, these dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt, these small planets that we didn't even really know existed until the 1990s. And in, in part because the Kuiper Belt and Pluto uh, can teach us a lot about the origin of the solar system, uh, the way that planets uh, grow, and about um, even the early Earth's formation and evolution through uh, the analogies between the pluto charon binary and the Earth-Moon system and how they form similarly in a giant impact and through the escape process that's taking place today in Pluto's atmosphere called hydrodynamic escape. It's how the Earth 
lost its early hydrogen helium envelope and evolved uh, to its current atmosphere. So those are some of the things that caused the National Academy of Sciences to put this at the top. And I think we also do this just speaking personally, uh, because in this country, um, uh, uh, we really want to leave a legacy of, of knowledge and, uh, and of exploration. You know, the United States was first to Venus and first to Mars, and we've been first every planet all the way across the solar system. And as I said at the beginning, this is the capstone event. This is the exploration um, uh, bookend to what began in the 1960s with Mars and Venus and is now completing at the Pluto system. Jim? Well, you know, Pluto is such a fantastic object as part of a whole new family of objects that we've never seen before. We virtually know nothing about Pluto. We have some tantalizing pieces of information that we've got from ground-based telescopes, space-based telescopes, and now we're actually going to fly through the Pluto system and get for the very first time a detailed look at a brand new set of objects we've never seen before. You know, there's probably maybe a hundred thousand objects like Pluto beyond Pluto. Right now we have identified probably close to 2,000 of them. You know, this is a fabulous new region in our solar system left unexplored and Alan's right, it's just a fabulous day for, for the United States, for NASA, to be the first to fly through this system and take a good look at it. And something Jim just said is very important. Kuiper Belt is this vast array of objects, very few of them, really just a handful, um, the scale of Pluto. Most of them are like the scale of cities and counties or small New England states. Um, so we're really going to the biggest object we know of out there with the most complex satellite system. And I'd like Alex Parker, who's one of the world's experts in Kuiper Belt studies, to chip in his perspective. Sure. The Pluto is really kind of the keystone of the Kuiper Belt. We've known about it the longest. Um, we have more uh, baseline for taking, taking a, the snapshot that we get from the Pluto system uh, when we fly through and, and trying to understand what that means for the evolution of the Pluto system itself. Um, you know, we've been studying its atmosphere for decades, for example, and its atmosphere evolves with time. There's no other Kuiper Belt object that's been known for that long. We certainly don't know of any others that have an atmosphere, let alone, let alone one that's evolving like Pluto's. So if you're gonna if you're gonna pick a world that's gonna have, you know, long-term implications or be able to sort of be tied to a, a long history of observations, Pluto is probably the best place to go first. Um, additionally, Pluto really gets you um, as uh, Alan has said a lot of bang for your buck. You've got a lot of satellites in the system. You've got the Charon, um, the Charon large, uh, the largest moon of Pluto, which probably doesn't have an atmosphere. We'll be looking for one, but as best we can tell, it doesn't have one. Its surface is probably less active than Pluto, so its surface will act as a record of um, the cratering history, the impact history in the Kuiper Belt. So it will tell us something about the small object population that is totally invisible from from Earth that we'll never be able to detect um, except through uh, through observations like this. Then there's these smaller satellites, which probably formed along with the pluto charon uh, formation event. They're a lot smaller, they're a lot more like the typical Kuiper Belt objects. We don't know that they're exactly like them because they probably formed in this special environment around Pluto, but they're a lot more like them than, than anything else we've ever flown by. So going through this system, not only do we get Pluto, this thing that we've studied for decades and decades, and finally get a ground truth measurement to tie that huge archive of observation to, we get all these other small systems that are evolving more like typical Kuiper Belt objects without having to go anywhere else. Now, we can't stop in the Pluto system either. We're bulleting through, and we're going to end up um, passing through the Kuiper Belt. And if an extended mission for New Horizons is approved, we get um, to visit uh, a more distant Kuiper Belt object in 2019. Last summer, we completed uh, one of the largest Hubble surveys for Kuiper Belt objects ever conducted, and we discovered two objects that we could potentially reach with the spacecraft. So um, while we're going to Pluto first, in a few years' time, there's a chance that we could carry on and actually see one of these small and more typical Kuiper Belt objects as well. Awesome. That's great. So you said that we're kind of bulleting through the system. Um, how long has it taken us to get out to, and I know Alan said earlier, how long has it taken us get, to get all the way out to Pluto? And, and can you give us, can somebody give us kind of a, a relativistic, like how fast is New Horizons going compared to other space probes that we've sent out? Well, Alice is our mission operations manager. She's 
she shepherded the entire mission operations team ever since before launch. So why don't you take that? Um, okay. Uh, so one of the challenges that we face is just what you said, Rick, is um, Pluto is so, so far away from Earth. And I don't really think of the distance in terms of kilometers or billions of miles, but in terms of light time delay. Um, for example, it takes uh, eight minutes for light from the sun to reach Earth. That covers a distance of one AU. And then from Earth to where Pluto, where the spacecraft is now, New Horizons, it's uh, eight hours and 52 minutes round trip time. So that's about four hours and 26 minutes one way. So that's how far um, we are uh, from our spacecraft. And when we get to Pluto, we'll just be a few more minutes, um, actually, because of the way the uh, Earth is coming out from behind the sun, it'll be a little bit shorter uh, round trip flight time when we get to Pluto. So we'll encounter Pluto when we're at 32 AU uh, from Earth. Rick, it's, it's hard to grasp the speed of New Horizons. Um, we once did a calculation that it's basically going LA to New York about every two minutes, 24 seven for nine years. And the day that we launched it, it passed the orbit of the moon in just nine hours. That's about 10 times faster than Apollo missions. Gives you some idea of the speed. But we've actually set a record in terms of cross, first fastest to Jupiter's orbit, fastest to Saturn's orbit, fastest to Uranus's orbit, fastest to Neptune's orbit, and first to Pluto, of course. Um, it, it really is amazing to think about the power that that Atlas V rocket and its special upper stage built by Boeing combined with a Jupiter flyby gravity assist gave us to cross all this expanse of space that Alice spoke about in such a record short time. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, I guess my next question would be, um, you talked about that we're going to get, we're going to do our flyby in a couple months, um, but how soon are we going to actually start getting some really cool images of Pluto as we're getting up close? And uh, what kind of things do you guys expect to see as we're actually approaching Pluto? Well, I think a lot, a lot of people in the group will have something to say about that. Would you okay. That well, I'm a, as eager as anyone to see the images. And uh, indeed, uh, the plan is to take uh, uh, data all the way up and through the Pluto system uh, and then send some snapshots back. Uh, and that's time such that uh, we get a good glimpse. Uh, we have to know exactly where Pluto is. Uh, and for that, uh, perhaps uh, our operations or, or Glenn can give us a little bit more of a detail. Well, we're actually uh, posting images now. Uh, if you go out on the Pluto website, you will see some of those images, and we'll be taking more and more as we get into the system. So people can go to the Pluto website uh, and, and start looking at the images, and there will be more coming down as we go forward over the next months. And it will get more and more exciting as we get into the system. So come June, things are really going to be exciting as we get more and more detail, not only of Pluto, but of Charon, and we start looking at some details of the other small satellites that are there. Right now, we're just turning to uh, the, the first images that can start to show a little bit of a disk in the distance, still 70 million miles away. And then soon, we'll begin spectroscopy for composition purposes. We'll start to make color imagery. And then, uh, beginning in late May, we'll be close enough that our resolution will be better than anything that could be obtained from the Earth. By the time we get there in July, the best images would be able to, if we flew over the Earth at the same altitude, resolve large buildings like stadiums. So we're really going from a state of knowledge now where our best pictures of Pluto just have a few pixels uh, to having very detailed maps all in a space of just a dozen or so weeks. Yes, in fact, the images we'll get at close approach will be 5,000 times better than any image we've ever seen of the system. So that gives you some, some idea of the increase in knowledge we're going to have. Great. Um, I wanted to kind of join in with another person online that has already been trying to ask a question, but I had this question too. What kind of other instruments besides, you know, we, we've got some instruments for taking photos and, and doing imaging of, the, of, of Pluto or anything else 
New, Hor- New Horizons comes aclo- across. But what other instruments are on the spacecraft? Kelsey and Alex, can you guys go through the payload? Sure. Um, so I'll mention a couple of the um, uh, instruments that are good for our composition. So you mentioned the imager already, which will be great for looking at the features on the surface and thinking about the geology. Um, and then we have other instruments that are also a type of imager, but they image in different wavelengths. Um, so you can get some information about the composition of the material that you're looking at. And that'll also be great for figuring out what kind of geologic processes um, are going on. Um, and then we have instruments that are looking at the plasma um, and the particles in all the way out there, but in the Pluto system. And what am I missing? Uh, the X-ray radio experiment. Yep. Um, so uh, we'll be doing um, very precise uh, measurements of the time and uh, phase of radio signals to and from the spacecraft as it flies through the system that can um, probe things like Pluto's atmosphere and, and other effects in the system. Uh, we also are carrying the Venetia Bernie student dust counter, which is basically a really souped up uh, microphone. And so it's it's uh, the entire during the entirety of the flight, it's um, listening for tiny impacts of microscopic dust particles impacting the spacecraft at hyper uh, hyper velocity speeds. And what that's telling us about is the dust environment in the inter- in interplanetary space, and we'll be recording that as it travels on out to the Pluto system. It's um, recording the dust density further from the sun than has ever been done before. Um, the instrument was built here in Colorado at, at the University of the Street here um, by graduate students. Um, and I believe it was the first uh, instrument uh, flown on a NASA mission, um, one of these, to, uh, built by students, built and designed by students. Is that correct, Alan? It's the first instrument on a NASA planetary mission built by right. students. Correct, yeah. Students Absolutely. have been in Earth orbiters and things like that, but this is something New Horizons pioneered. So in total, what they've told you about are seven scientific instruments, uh, two imagers, uh, two spectrometers, one for the atmosphere and one for the surface, uh, a pair of plasma instruments, radio science, and, and then the, the Venetia Bernie student dust counter. And together, they form the most powerful suite of instruments ever sent on a first reconnaissance mission. And that's primarily because they were built with 2000s technology. The last time something like this was done was for the spectacular Voyager missions that were launched in the 70s with 70s technology. And although they were state of art for their time, we all know how far electronics and optics and other other aspects of the technology have come along. So what New Horizons is carrying is a just unprecedented battery of scientific firepower that'll make thermal maps, that'll make geologic maps, composition maps, study the structure of Pluto's atmosphere, its composition, uh, uh, its temperature, that'll be able to tell us even about uh, the topographic heights of features across the surface, and not just Pluto, but also the satellites as well. And there's more, like looking for new moons, looking for rings, determining the precise masses of objects in the system and their precise sizes. Um, and I, I haven't said it all, but I think you get the idea that it's a pretty powerful package that's going to be returning a lot of data. In fact, over a thousand images will be on the ground before closest approach. So how, did, how exactly does that compare with the type of instruments that were on Voyager? Do you guys, have you guys ever actually looked at like what the resolution and, and the comparisons are? Well, you know, Voyager was a really big spacecraft, and, they, and we built two of them. And indeed, it had plasma instruments, and it had uh, magnetic field and imagers and large scan platforms. And in fact, um, uh, the technology used in New Horizons is so advanced that we use so much less power, and the, and the instruments are so more powerful, and, and, and their mass is, uh, uh, you know, a fraction of what the uh, Voyagers were. And so uh, for more details of that, uh, perhaps, Alan, you might mention uh, the amount of power that you're currently consuming. Yeah, well, we run all seven instruments at once. I, I never get tired of this number. All seven instruments and their microprocessors, if you run them at one time, draw a combined total of 28 watts. That's about half a light bulb, half a standard 60-watt light bulb. And, and think of the firepower this way. On Voyager, the composition mapping spectrometer 
which was state of the art for its time, had one pixel. Our composition mapping spectrometer has over 65,000 pixels. And on Voyager, the ultraviolet spectrometer for studying the atmosphere had exactly two pixels. Ours is 32,000. That's what technology can do for you. And that's a pretty good comparison of the kind of firepower that we're bringing in. There's another element of that that's extremely important, and that is uh, the amount of memory that you have on board. And this is what's really critical to understand about New Horizons, in the sense that it's going to be so far away, even though we'll get some data back, the bulk of the data will really be stored on board. And it, it has, uh, uh, how much memory does it have? <laughs> We're carrying, that's a, that's a really good question, that's a really good point, in fact. We have two solid state recorders, each 64 gigabits, uh, and we can take data about 100 times as fast as we can ship it to the ground. So all that data that we collect, and that's the way we designed it, is to be very effective at encounter, but all that data we collect in the days when we're closest will take months and months to ship it all home. Glenn, you yeah, want to add yeah, something? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to kind of get in on this because the design of the spacecraft is really very elegant. We had a number of challenges that we had to overcome. Yeah, That's thanks. So this is a model of the spacecraft. And so the first thing that we had to do is make the spacecraft light enough so that we could put it on the most powerful rocket we have in our arsenal of, of launch vehicles and get it to Pluto in nine and a half years. So the whole thing is about the size and about the mass, the weight of a concert grand piano. So think of a grand piano with a big salad bowl on its top. <laughs> so the salad bowl is the high gain antenna. So when we communicate back to the Earth with all the data that Alan is talking about, uh, we're able to do that with a transmitter who's Transmitting power is 12 watts. Now, I have a nightlight in my bathroom that's 4 watts. So three times the power of my nightlight is the power that we're, we're communicating across 3 billion miles and having to send back all the data that we're putting on these 64 gigabit recorders. That will take a while. Yeah, it's at a data rate of about 1,000 bits per second. Yeah, I, I often say that it's kind of... Uh, 1990 modem rate, maybe a bad modem rate. We also have uh, another antenna called the mid-game antenna that we can use in emergencies if we should. And I say that we communicate with it with the kind of a bad Morse code rate. But, but we have this kind of elegance in the design. And we use a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, which is this, this device that I'm looking at here uh, on this end. Uh, that's what generates the total power we have for the spacecraft, which is 200 watts. So it's two 100-watt light bulbs is what we're running the whole spacecraft on. So many, many things went into this design. How long did that design process take you guys? Or wh whichever team? Did, who, who actually built the spacecraft for you? Uh, the spacecraft was designed and built and tested here at the Applied Physics Laboratory with a lot of help. Instruments uh, that were managed by Southwest. We went to Goddard for some of our testing. Uh, but the, the basic design was done here. It was four years from the time we actually got funded to start this design to the, to the date we got it on the launch bed. To the day. The, the, the announcement of opportunity uh, was actually the year before that, on the 19th of uh, January in 2001. We spent a year in the competition, and then four years designing, building, testing, and getting it on the rocket. Which is a pretty fast pace. A, lo a lot of missions take more like six to eight years, but we were under the gun because we wanted to make that Jupiter launch window to get the gravity assist. And that required launching in January of 06 or waiting almost another 10 years. And, and the team of people that worked on this spent nights and weekends, uh, incredible dedication to get this done in four years flat. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to just add on to that uh, because the team has been so dedicated, it's just incredible the amount of time and effort and dedication. 
one story that I love to tell, we were in the process of getting the, the spacecraft built. And one of the engineers that oversaw a lot of our fabrication work came to work in such a bad day that he parked his vehicle in our parking lot and it was so slick from the snow that his vehicle actually slid down the hill that he was at work. <laughs> wow, that's pretty crazy. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about how this new space probe is going to add to our understanding of all of the planets in our solar system, including these uh, small planets like Pluto? Yeah, I think that the, some of the scientists on the team can do that. Let's start in Boulder uh, with Kelsey on the, the more the geology and geophysics side, which is her expertise. And Alex can talk about the connection to planetary accretion in the Kuiper Belt, where he's an expert. And then uh, maybe Jim and I will chip in when we come back. Sure. So um, the comparative planetology is one of the um, things we love to do. And so we go to another place, and we see what kinds of geology is there. And then we can compare that to what we see on Earth, and we can learn a lot more that way. Um, so, for example, if we see giant landslides on Earth, that's under one set of conditions. Um, and then you go to Mars, and you get a different set of conditions, and even to an icy satellite where there's some very large landslides, and we see a different set of conditions. So it's kind of like getting a um, planetary scale test, a uh, planetary scale laboratory to look at these different kinds of features, um, and then you can learn a lot more that way. So instead of just having one example in one set of conditions on Earth, we have a whole bunch of other things that really help us learn about how these processes occur. Um, so, for example, we expect to see some kinds of tectonics probably on Pluto. So this could be something like a fault, um, or um, it could be a scarp, something like that. Um, we can see craters. We think for sure we'll see some of those. Um, as Alex was mentioning, we might see more of those on Charon, but that's another example. Um, everyone knows about craters from the moon, but there's also plenty of craters on Earth. Um, so there's a lot of different features we can look at um, and do kind of comparative planetology and learn a lot about the features on all the different planets. Yeah, and then Pluto itself, you know, I described it earlier as sort of the keystone to the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt itself is, is significant to planetary science um, because of how pristine in a lot of ways it is. It is, it is likely the most representative population of um, primordial bodies in the solar system or, or bodies whose uh, properties, if you understand them, you understand um, uh, how things formed very early on. The smaller Kuiper Belt objects are, are sort of representative of the building blocks of the bigger planets. Pluto is one of the largest or the largest Kuiper Belt object that we know about. Um, it likely didn't form exactly where it is now. It probably formed somewhere closer to the sun and was swept outward um, during the late stages of planet formation as Neptune and the other giant planets were migrating around in their orbits and kind of um, shoving around some of these smaller guys. Uh, it eventually got trapped into the resonance with, with Neptune that it's in right now. Pluto orbits the sun two times for every three orbits of Neptune and that's a dynamically locked configuration. They can't, it's difficult for it to leave that. There are many other bodies locked into that configuration, and how those bodies got into that resonance um, tells you a lot about the uh, processes that were involved in migration and the disk that Neptune was migrating through. Um, so looking at uh, the Pluto system as, you know, as sort of holistically, how, it, how it's embedded in this bigger population, these small satellites in the system uh, if they formed, you know, before this large mix-up, they had to survive it. If they formed after, you have to come up with a formation mechanism that is likely to have occurred after the Kuiper Belt sort of emptied out. So there's there's a lot that you can learn from this by looking at the bigger context and by getting an up-close picture of Pluto, um, we can kind of come at it from a different angle. I've, I've come at the Kuiper Belt from a, a statistical uh, angle. You look at, you know, you take a, many bodies with very little information about each and you try to paint a picture with a little bit of information about a lot of things. And we're going to complement that by going to Pluto and getting a lot of information about one or two or three or five things, right? We've got all these small satellites in the system. So it's actually not that small numbers. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell. You know, you can fool yourself when you're looking at this sort of big picture, um, little information with a lot of things. If you don't understand one aspect of how you're doing that problem correctly, then, then you can carry on for a long time without realizing what the truth is, but when you go in and you get a ground truth, a lot of detail on one object like this, you can really, really nail down a lot of those things. So that's 
a lot of the value of the Pluto system to me. You know, uh, you know, we have this burning desire to understand the origin and evolution of our solar system. And when you step back and look at it, we know about our rocky planets, and then and that's one group, uh, you know, Mercury, Earth, Moon, and of course uh, Mars. The next set is really these big giant gas and, and icy, ice, uh, icy worlds. Um, uh, you know, so you've got the gas giants, Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, Neptune, but Pluto represents an entirely new class of objects, you know, our third class of objects in our solar system. You can stand on the surface of Pluto, can on Saturn, you can on Jupiter, and so it, it's also an, uh, a region that's very far away from the sun. And each and every one of our spacecraft have to be built in a way that takes advantage of uh, uh, certain capabilities to look at these bodies in these environments. You know, Messenger at Mercury's got a sunshade. To go out to the outer planets beyond Jupiter, we've got to have radioisotope power. We've got to bring that stuff with us. So not only is it a brand new set of objects, but it brings its own set of challenges in the way we manage and operate and, and design our spacecraft. So this is really at that frontier. You know, planetary science, we've got a series of spacecraft that have gone to planets and we typically fly by. We then want to or orbit, we then want to land, and then want to row. And for Pluto, this is really our last great flyby of that third section of the solar system. It's going to be historic. Rick, I'll, I'll chip in. Uh, I guess I'm the caboose on this, but I'll tell you about one of my favorite aspects of the exploration, the scientific exploration. And that is, we've had inklings for a while that both Pluto and its Texas-sized satellite, Charon, um, are active. That is, we have seen over the decades changes in Pluto's atmosphere, its atmospheric pressure has somewhere between doubled and tripled. And some of the surface markings have moved around on the surface with time, indicating that there could be huge uh, climate effects or potentially uh, geological effects that are causing those markings to change on a planetary scale. We really don't understand how that could be. We also have seen evidence on the big satellite, Charon, of uh, the potential for cryovulcanism. Uh, we see that with ammonium hydrates that are on the surface. We see a certain type of crystalline water ice um, which can't persist for a long time geologically because radiation breaks it down. And both of those chemical clues may be telling us that Sharon's surface is somehow getting uh, refreshed. And the big mystery there is because these worlds are relatively small, the size of Texas, or roughly the size of the United States. Um, we don't understand how their, their geophysical engines can be active after all these billions of years. Adding to that mystery, when Voyager 2 flew by a former Kuiper Belt planet called Triton, it got captured into orbit around Neptune. It found it was active. It found geysers going off on the surface at near absolute zero. All of these things um, are adding up to tell us that the small worlds are more interesting and that we don't understand the physics of their engines yet. But with the firepower that New Horizons is bringing, we hope not just to explore and find out what's there, but to start to answer these more fundamental questions about how small planets work. And I think that's going to be one of the most exciting parts as a scientist. Kind of related to what you were saying there, Alan, um, somebody asked the question that they were saying, other than this uh, cryovolcanism, -volcan sorry, if I can say it. that right, um, is there any other way that New Horizons can actually find out if there's some kind of subsurface oceans or, or movements or some, something going on on Pluto and Charon? And uh, his, I don't know if it's a, yeah, his specific question was, is there a way that we can do that by measuring radioactive potassium or something like that to, to find out what's actually going on down there? You're, the questioner is asking a really good question, and he probably knows that there are uh, scientific models that predict that there may be an ocean on the inside of Pluto down at depth where under the pressure of the ice, um, the temperatures get warmer and warmer, and eventually 
uh, the ice becomes viscous and then may even melt. And there are even models that say that may be the case in this big satellite Sharon as well. We could have two worlds with interior oceans there. Kelsey can say some more about it, but one of the experiments that I'm looking forward to to help shed light on whether there are oceans today is, is to look for geysers like at Enceladus that, that are directly in contact with the subsurface liquids that could be spewing out of Pluto or Charon. And secondly, to look at the forms of geological expression. Um, and for example, if the ice is soft because there's a liquid layer below, it may be that all the topography is collapsed down like pancakes rather than steep relief. And we see that on worlds like Europa and other icy satellites as telltale hints of interior oceans. We'll look for the same and there are other techniques we can use as well and I'll ask Kelsey who's a geophysicist by training to talk about that. Sure, yeah. So um, the questioner mentioned a couple things already um, like looking one thing we can do is look at the overall shape of the body. Um, so if it's perfectly spherical or not, that'll tell us about the internal structure. Um, if there's some kind of weird topography, so Alan already mentioned, if some things are really flat, um, we think that is an indication of high heat, and so that could lead to melting in an internal ocean. Um, but if you have like a big lump on one side or at the pole or different places, that can also tell you about how the body has um, reoriented with time, which could imply that you need a liquid layer in order to get that reorientation. Um, Alan talked uh, you know, about flattened topography, but craters, even though they sound kind of boring, I think they're fascinating. Um, they can tell you all sorts of fun stuff. So if we see, the, the thing about craters is that we know what their shape generally is when it first forms. Um, smaller craters have kind of a bowl shape, um, and bigger craters have more of a pie pan shape. Um, and so since we know kind of generally what they form um, as, if they've been altered, we can use that to say what was the history of this object. Um, so Alan also mentioned Europa. So Europa has a neighboring moon, Ganymede. It's a bigger moon, but they're right next to each other in, in Jupiter's line of moons. Um, and Europa does have this subsurface ocean. So as everyone knows, ice floats on water, so that's why you get um, an icy layer on the outside and then the ocean underneath. Um, and it's warm enough on Europa to get this ocean. And if you look at the craters on Europa and you look at the craters on Ganymede, they look very different. Um, and that's because the craters on Europa, even when they form, form a little bit differently because they're feeling the presence of the ocean underneath all that ice. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things we can look for. Um, and I think there'll certainly be signs one way or the other. Cool. Craters on ice. I like it. Um, another, another thing that came up, um, and uh, maybe to tie this a little bit back to, um, to Yuri's night slightly, so, so the guy who runs our website that keeps it going uh, throughout the day today, which you know, we just get hit like crazy, um, basically asked the question of how do you guys keep a spacecraft running? Um, you know, you, you guys have probably the third spacecraft that's gone so far out from Earth. And how do you keep it running and how do you keep it powered and um, keep everything functional uh, when it's so far away? How did how did you build that so reliably that you're, you're confident it's still going to work three months from now and get all the data that you want? Yeah, well, you start with the design. And you, you think about it so that you have enough redundancy in the system that you have high confidence that it will be operating for this long period of time. We started with uh, a system design that has a lot of uh, redundancy. Luckily, we've not had to use any of that. It's, we're still operating on the primary systems. We use the radioisotope thermoelectric power generator, which is probably the most reliable power source you can get. Uh, it uses uh, plutonium and uh, so the de radioactive decay generates heat which generates the couple hundred watts. So and we then have systems on board that can monitor the health of the spacecraft and cause it to phone home if you will if it has a problem and needs help. And the other important part of keeping this system running all these years is 
the team on the ground. It's this dedicated team on the ground that has continually to monitor its progress uh, across the solar system, uh, seeing that it's on track. We made some very small adjustments to the trajectory, its path. So for instance, we're going about 30,000 miles an hour right now, and the spacecraft is. And we made an adjustment in March that's about three miles an hour. That's the kind of correction that we've been making, uh, and we've only done a few of these over the nine years. But all that is handled by Alice and her team, and they're the ones that, with the larger team, bringing information in, helping us decide, uh, make it all go so well. So Alice can maybe add to that, because she's the one where the rubber meets the road so far as keeping things going. So one reason why I love my job is because I get to work with the scientists and understand their objectives at a high level and translate that into spacecraft commands. And I work with the engineering team to do that. Um, we are charged with taking, uh, developing a set of commands for the spacecraft. And of course, we work with the science operation team and, and the mission operations team. And we work with the engineering team to understand what the constraints are and that's on the spacecraft. So we put together tens of thousands of lines of commands that are going to be sent to the spacecraft. Every single one of those sets of commands has to play, play nice with the spacecraft, meaning that we can't, use, we, we can't have a command set that uses more power than, it's, than is available. We have to make sure that we turn the spacecraft. You saw that from Glenn, from Glenn when he held up the model that um, this antenna is not gimbaled. It's, it's one of those things that was designed in to help um, ensure that the spacecraft was uh, nothing broke on it, basically, because things that move tend to break. <laughs> um, more readily than things that are fixed. So in order to take science observations, you have to point the spacecraft to take those science observations. Um, and likewise, you have to turn and point to Earth when you communicate with Earth. So we have commands that take science, and then we have to turn and downlink or play back all that great data that's collected on board. And and so the operations team is charged with making that all work very smoothly. We're also charged with if there's any kind of issue on the spacecraft that happens, we need to um, understand what has happened. We have a spacecraft simulator on the ground that we will uh, simulate what has happened on the spacecraft and then um, use that simulator to uh, determine how we're going to fix whatever is going on on board. So that is, that's our job, and it's, it's really quite interesting because we get to learn about the science, we get to learn about the hardware and the spacecraft, and then of course we have, um, we use the deep space network that's managed by uh, JPL to communicate with the spacecraft, and we have to understand how long it takes those signals from the spacecraft to reach Earth, and we have to make sure that there's an antenna on the ground to capture that signal and that data that's coming down. Now one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, uh, Voyager 1 and 2 uh, was uh, discussed at, and uh, New Horizons, but there are two others that actually uh, flew by Jupiter, uh, Pioneer 10 and 11. Now both Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons are on their way uh, uh, through the solar system and will uh, they're on escape trajectories. Pioneer 10 and 11 no longer operate. Uh, they actually um, uh, died soon after uh, their main missions. Uh, Voyager 1 and 2 are still operating, and of course uh, New Horizons is uh, making the historic journey uh, through the Pluto system. So in reality then there are five uh, sun escaping missions for which three are still working. And I think the, the other thing that's important in this, how are we making the spacecraft operate so far from Earth? It's truly an enterprise, and it's an enterprise that's sponsored by NASA, uses technologies and teams that have been maintained over the years by NASA so that we can do the kind of things that New Horizons is doing. So it's this larger enterprise. Alice was talking about the Deep Space Network, something that 
that NASA built decades ago and maintains. Uh, so all these pieces had to come together to make this kind of a mission, this kind of exploration possible. Yeah, the other thing that I realize as a mission principal investigator is that in projects like this, of this scope, uh, uh, it really requires large numbers of different kinds of expertise. So we have propulsion engineers, we have software engineers, we have power system experts, we have experts in each instrument technology, in artificial intelligence, basically the software that you heard about from Alice and Glenn that watches after the spacecraft and can make um, uh, autonomous corrections. Uh, we have many others, you know, trajectory experts and tracking experts and communications experts and all those people have to play together as a team. It's sort of like an orchestra that even though each individual player is talented on their own, uh, to play the symphony, they have to learn to play together and they have to be conducted by a great conductor or a pair of conductors <laughs> like our project manager and our mission operations <laughs> manager. And that coordination is one of the hardest parts of spaceflight because it requires exacting communication between all these different teams and expertise, no misunderstandings, uh, not just to create all that computer code that Alice talked about, but then to put it through the mission simulators and test it and test it with other software tools that we have in addition to the hardware simulator so that by the time we put it up on the spacecraft, it's bulletproof and it's going to work because our spacecraft is nine hours round trip light time away from us, as Alice said, and if we instruct it to do something bad to itself by accident, we can't get that back for nine hours. So we have to make sure that what we're sending up is always good and that if it has a way to go bad that we've tested it and that if even if it's tested that the spacecraft is doing its own autonomous checks up there to make sure that we haven't done anything where we might have missed something. And fortunately in nine plus years, 112 months that we have been on the road, um, we have not yet had a bad day. We've had a couple of hiccups along the road which is better than any electronic device I have ever bought, no matter how much money I spent. Um, but we have never had a really bad day. We have never made a serious mistake, nor has the spacecraft, uh, nor has any of the hardware ever let us down. It's really amazing. So you said that the spacecraft has a little bit of uh, like intelligence of its own. And so I was just wondering, so is it actually smart enough that if you if you do something bad, like will it will it be able to figure out, oh, now I need to go back and, and point back point itself back towards Earth or something to That's tell you right. that something went wrong? Exactly right. The spacecraft is capable of detecting about 150 different faults that range from computer resets to the guidance system system that ever got lost to a fuel leak, and those are just three examples. Um, and for each of those faults, when it it, it declares a fault, the software is capable of running down a checklist for how to uh, isolate the fault, take care of the immediate problem, and then turn the antenna back to the Earth and call for help from Alice's team. Cool. So another question I had was um, kind of alluded to earlier, but um, in terms of this being a flyby of Pluto, why, you know, it, why isn't there some kind of way that we can swing around or do something, or is there not a way we can stay any longer at Pluto than, um, I think you said, I think about you know, four weeks or something that'll be really, really well in view of the spacecraft? Jim's going to start. Well, you know, New Horizons was designed as a flyby. It, it, it was, it, that's the most economical way we can go and get there. Uh, that helped uh, actually uh, uh, solidify the, the design and allowed Glenn and the team uh, uh, to put it together to make it work. Now, after the flyby and after the data starts coming back, I'm sure we're going to see what an exciting place Pluto is, and that'll solicit other ideas on how we might want to go back and perhaps get into orbit. But that'll be a completely different mission, may have completely different instruments. And you have to think about this as our first survey. And so you want a comprehensive set of instruments. Those will guide us on what we'll see and, of course, what we'll do next in response to that from a scientific point of view. And there, you know, that's been the history of planetary exploration. Um, at every planet, we started with flybys. We get the lay of the land from those data sets, and then we send in orbiters or landers as, as the next 
uh, more informed missions. In the case of this mission, not only are we just following the pattern, which is very well thought out, but if you think about the tremendous speed of New Horizons, we got that speed primarily from this enormous Atlas V rocket, over 220 feet tall, like a downtown building. And to kill all that speed would take a similar amount of rocketry, which this little tiny spacecraft can't fit on board. So in order to make the crossing fast, um, there is no way technically to put it in orbit. Even if we did have a way to do that, then we wouldn't be able to go on into the Kuiper Belt to do the kind of further exploration that the National Academy um, asked this mission to do an extended mission down the road. So from my perspective, this is the perfect mission for a first mission to Pluto. It follows the pattern. It's going to get the lay of the land. It's going very fast because that helps you improve your reliability. If Glenn's spacecraft had to run for 20 years instead of for roughly 10, there'd be a lower probability of success if we went slower. And then if we stopped, we wouldn't be able to go on and do even deeper space exploration. I think we're at the sweet spot, and I love this. Does the New Horizons spacecraft have limitations where it's not going to be able to like keep sending back data way down the road like uh, Voyager? spacecraft have or like how much how much far, how far out can you guys actually go and still bring back data if there your mission keeps on getting extended there are two limitations uh, we have a consumable which we are husbanding very very carefully and that is the propellant that allows us to maneuver the spacecraft the other one is the amount of energy on board the power to run the spacecraft and all of these, the Voyagers and, and New Horizons, use the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, the RTGs, and they have a decay rate so that eventually we will not have enough power. But we believe we can operate the spacecraft out into at least 2030, possibly beyond, uh, before the power gets to uh, such a low level that we cannot command and transmit uh, signals from the spacecraft. Well, wow. that's quite a long ways. Yes, um, it would be, it's a ways down the road. <laughs> um, so we're getting close to the end of our time, but I just wanted to ask, so in terms of that extended mission, uh, what was the, the body that you guys are looking to go out and see? And tell us a little bit more about why you chose um, the, the object out, you know, a couple of years farther out that you chose. I'll speak to that. At first, Alex may want to chip in some more, or Jim may want to. Um, it's really a needle, a state-of-the-art needle in a haystack problem. Uh, what we want to do is find objects that are the building blocks of the small planets like Pluto. So whereas, if you know, if you drove around Pluto's equator, it's, it's a large place. It's the distance driving around the equator from Manhattan all the way to Moscow. But these little guys are much different. They're more like the size of big counties, the things out of which these planets were made. And because they're tiny, and necessarily further away so we can go next, um, they're very, very faint. You can't see Pluto with your naked eye. You need a real telescope to see it. It's about, not quite, but almost 10,000 times too faint to see by naked eye. And these objects that we had to go find to fly by later are about another 10,000 times fainter than Pluto. So that took the Hubble Space Telescope, and we trained it not on where we're not on the space right behind Pluto, but like shooting skeet, where the spacecraft will be. So we had to lead the field of view for objects that we discover in 2014 that would be where our trajectory is going in the late 20 teens. And with the Hubble, we found ultimately five candidates, two of which are within our fuel supply. And they don't have very interesting names. We call them Potential Target, or PT1, and PT3. Um, someday they'll have real names, but currently they're just known as potential targets, and they have kind of technical license plates um, with a couple letters and a few numbers, but nobody ever remembers those uh, except in our team. So we just refer to them as potential target one and potential target three. And they are probably, if we get to do that mission from a technical and funding standpoint, um, they're probably going to be the farthest objects human beings explore in the first half of the 21st century. 
and perhaps the most pristine or unevolved since the birth of the solar system. Pretty amazing to think about. Alex, you want to add to that? Sure, I can just I'll lay out a little bit about um, what made uh, what made this selection sort of, you, you alluded to this, that we needed the Hubble to go to it. We spent a long time um, counting the first survey, almost a decade, um, trying to find targets that we could send New Horizons to with ground-based observatories. And the real challenge here, in addition to this faintness, these are these are as faint as the faintest Kuiper Belt objects that we've ever seen um, with any facility ever. Um, they're in the worst part of the sky that you could have possibly picked to look for Kuiper Belt objects. So if you actually uh, you know, were to plot up on, say, a planetarium um, where all of the known Kuiper Belt objects are, you'd see a gap. And that's because there's an area of the sky that's really painful to search for Kuiper Belt objects or moving objects. And that's deep in the galactic plane, so like in Sagittarius, where if it's a, you know, a dark sky, you can see the galaxy sweeping across the sky. All those stars are much, 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 much brighter than the Kuiper Belt objects that we're interested in finding. And they're packed together in the galactic plane. So if you're going to look for faint moving objects, you go somewhere where there's no stars. You look somewhere where the sky is sparse, but we didn't have that luxury. The spacecraft is going in the direction it's going, and we can, we can alter its course by um, a very narrow angle. So we're looking at a very narrow cone sweeping out into the outer solar system. So uh, because we're flying to Pluto and that set the mission's direction, we had to look in the direction, as Alan said, that sort of led uh, the New Horizons trajectory. Um, and that happened to be deep into uh, the galaxy. So these early data that we were taking from the ground were just packed full of stars, and uh, that made it an incredibly challenging problem. We had to uh, bring out very advanced image processing techniques to suppress the starlight and leave behind the moving objects. Um, and in that effort, we spent, like I said, about 10 years. I was working on the project for about four years. Um, uh, we found about 50 objects, uh, Kuiper Belt objects in those surveys. And some of them came close to being able to be reached by the spacecraft, factor 50% or so um, beyond the margin of fuel that we had. But we never got right down there. Um, and so 2014 came around, and that was really the sweet spot year. The area that we had to search, um, sort of as a function of time, it changed size. If you go back in time, the swarm of objects that you could be looking for covers a larger area. It gets small in 2014, and it starts to spread out again in the future after that. Plus, we had to have enough lead time, once we discovered these things, to measure the orbits well enough that we can light up New Horizons engines and fly precisely to them without a lot of waste. So we need to be able to know the orbits well enough. And that set 2014 as the year to do this. So that was the year we said, if we're ever going to go to Hubble, which is you know, a cherished resource and lots of people want time on it, so we're not going to go to it earlier or when we could do it better later. We went right then, and um, Pluto, uh, sorry, New Horizons... Uh, <laughs> Hubble delivered. We got unbelievably beautiful data. We saw some of the faintest objects in the Kuiper Belt we've ever seen. And out of this, we got these two objects that are well within the margins of New Horizons fuel budget. So now we're working uh, to characterize these targets. We're trying to understand their orbits, um, where they'll be in the future so we can precisely target them, uh, and the kind of fuel use resource uh, utilization that we'll need in order to get to them. Uh, we're trying to understand their surface properties. Do they look like other Kuiper Belt objects? Are they typical or atypical Kuiper Belt objects? And that would that change our selection criteria between PT1 and PT3? Maybe we'd want to go to the more typical one. Maybe we'd want to go to the atypical one. These are the decisions we'll have to make with these future observations and ongoing observations that we're making now. That's such an awesome synergy with like being able to use Hubble to do something on a completely different mission you know, years after, you know, that was designed years after Hubble, like, yeah. got up into space. That's great. So as we reach the end of our time, um, my final question is, how can people go out and learn more about the New Horizons mission as it comes up to the point where we're actually going to start seeing some cool imagery, and I'm sure that'll get shared on social media, and people start seeing things and trying to figure out what's going on. Where can people learn more? Well, I'll start, and maybe each person on the Hangout can each add a little something to that. And I'll start by saying, um, I'll talk about two particular things. One is you can just go to your browser, your search engine, and put in Pluto New Horizons, and lots of things will pop up. Um, recent news articles, of course, our website, at the project, and the NASA website, um, social media channels. But there are lots of other opportunities, uh, uh, ranging from uh, parties and broadcasts to uh, uh, specific things that some of the people on this hangout have created for us. 
And uh, Jim, you want to start with yeah. the headquarters uh, resources? I, you know, I think the, the next best exciting thing to get tuned into is uh, the upcoming press conference. Uh, we have one coming up this week. Uh, it's going to be really exciting. We're going to talk a lot more about what the spacecraft's got to do to be able to uh, make all the observations in an autonomous fashion. And it will be a huge amount of information that will uh, 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 get out to, uh, to the public. And, and uh, I think it um, will show how capable the system really is. Uh, Alex and, and Kelsey, why don't you talk about um, uh, Countdown to Pluto and some of the newsletters and mailing services that are out there for people. Sure, yeah, so um, we have a Spiffy Countdown site. It's at cpudonow.com, um, and you can also link to it from some of the other sites. So you can see um, as we're counting down both to the time of closest approach on July 14th, and other, some of the other milestones we have countdowns for, for as well. Um, and on that site, you can also see the Pluto picture of the day. Some of you might be familiar with the astronomy picture of the day. This is the Pluto version of that. Um, and then there's also sign-ups on both the APL website for a newsletter and on C Pluto now for kind of a shorter Twitter-style thing sent to your inbox. Um, additionally, one of the other postdocs, uh, Amanda Zangari, maintains a Tumblr blog, uh, Postcards from Pluto, uh, that has write-ups on various aspects of mission life and Pluto science and ongoing things. Um, that's a pretty good way to keep track of things in sort of a longer format. Um, yeah, Facebook, Twitter, there's a, uh, uh, Alan runs, Alan runs um, the New Horizons 2015 account. There's also the, the NASA run, um, NASA New Horizons. Um, a lot of the team members, um, maintain uh, personal Twitter accounts. I created a list of those. Um, so if you want to just keep track of what the you know um, what the team postdocs had for dinner last night, that might be a good place to <laughs> check that out. I'm not sure, but that's, uh, there's a there's a few resources like that. I'm sure as we get closer to to encounter, that's going to be dominated a lot more by by what we're doing on the mission and and uh, what life is like around headquarters or uh, mission headquarters. Um, yeah, so there's the, there are events going on called Pluto Palooza, and so those are parties that are going to be done at various spots around the country. Um, and I think that they can find out about those um, on the uh, pluto.jhuapl.edu page. Um, they're advertised there. So there are, there are um, great little ways that people, just ordinary people in small towns, big towns, can get involved with this mission. Yeah, I just want to re-echo re that. We do have a uh, part of our team is very focused on the public outreach and education support. Uh, we have been tracking uh, a group of young people, uh, some of which were 10 years old when uh, New Horizons was launched. Some were just born. And, uh, and so they've been engaged and people across the country have been engaged through our education outreach program. So uh, all of these things are you can reach and find out more about on the the NASA website, uh, the Pluto website through NASA, or at at the one that is here in the team. So go to both, or, or you can go to either one, and you'll you'll end up there. And uh, you can reach out and find out how you can get connected to. Pluto Paloozas and these other events. And you can watch NASA TV that will be covering this as we get closer. Um, you can look at for magazine covers like American Scientist, Astronomy, and Sky and Telescope that have already covered this mission. You can look for TV specials. We know of five that are being made about New Horizons for, for this summer. Um, and uh, you can just look for grassroots websites. One of my favorites is for children, and it's called Letters to Pluto, or Dear Pluto, actually, where children can write letters to or about Pluto or make little video vignettes there. So uh, just by searching around, you'll find an amazing amount of material, both at the project and NASA websites, and just what people who are interested are putting together. That's great. And I know we here at Yuri's Night are definitely interested. So we'll be, even even though Yuri's Night will be over by the time we get close, uh, I'm sure we'll be reposting and, and retweeting and stuff, all the stuff coming off of the New Horizons mission as it comes up. So thank you guys for posting all that stuff. And thank you again for having this hangout with us to celebrate 
New Horizons and celebrate Yuri's Night this year. We really, really appreciate it, and thank you to everybody who has come and, and has been viewing this uh, this hangout with us. It looks like a, there's a few dozen now and probably a lot more later. So thanks a lot, and uh, thank you to the New Horizons team, and we hope that everybody out there has an excellent Yuri's Night today, tonight, this weekend, and in the coming years and, and uh, decades going forward. Watch New Horizons, and have a great, great day. Thanks. Thank you, Rick, and thank thanks you. for your time. Thanks. Bye.